Hi, Matthew, can you hear me? Hi, Matt. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, I gave you co-host. Would you like me to just give you the host? Um, so um, you can just control it all from your computer? It, uh, it doesn't matter to me whatever works best, as long as I can share my yeah. screen. I wonder, do you mind, um, I have two screens, and I'd like to just make sure uh, why don't you test it out, out correctly? Let me uh, let you on as the uh, screen. Did, did you enable your? Um, let's see, you are now the host. Let's see, can you enable um, your screen? Do you want me to share the screen? Is that what you mean? Or yeah, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, if you click share, should okay. So you have that. Oh yeah, okay. All right, so everyone else should be on mute and then you'll just share the phone with um, with John. Okay, and John's gonna come here, yeah, physically, so. Um, okay. Are you able to see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, your screen's coming up. Great, okay, then I think we're all set. Okay, I'll do a brief. Except John's not here yet. Oh, he's not. Okay. <laughs> so, did you want to? Uh, so, which screen do you it? see? Do you see the one with the notes, or do you see? Uh, I see uh, your slides. I see slides, and okay. then I see your text on the side. Yeah. Oh, you do see the text. It says over. Let me remove. Yeah, I don't think we want to show that. No. Um, it's your slide, just. You full screen. How's that now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. All right. We will just uh, be on hold then for John to arrive. Okay. Perfect. Well, I will keep checking on um, the attendees. Let me see. Yeah, so there's seven other people.
Hey, Brian. Yes. John's here now. Okay, great. We have a couple of attendees, so um, right at 12 o'clock, we, we will get started. Great. Are we on camera by any chance? No. Matthew, can you tell me how you pronounce your last name? It's Kabashima. Oh, John. Okay. Kabashima. And then Matthew? Uh, Dianus. Okay. Perfect. All right, we can get started. Um, I appreciate everyone for coming today. Uh, this is a SoCal ASLA webinar event for the Shop Hole Board. Uh, we will be having uh, Matthew Denise, Denise and John Kabishima, um, who will be presenting uh, their research and uh, work that they are doing at the UCI campus. Uh, Matt Dinis is a registered landscape architect, a UCI planner for eight years, and works on physical planning and sustainability related projects, urban forests. Uh, he helps UCI with the Tree Campus USA project status for eight years, uh, 1,000 trees planted, uh, developing updated uh, the climate action plan and water action plan. Um, and John Kabashima is a Pull his. He works for the University of California Cooperative mm -hmm. Extension Environmental Horticulture Advisor, and advise, he's an advisor emeritus. Uh, he also works for Disneyland Horticulture, Urban Forest, IPM team member and trainer. Uh, John has varied research and extension programs that have been included in management of insects, disease, and weeds, and horticulture production systems and urban landscapes, biological control of exotic pests, water use, and related problems of the landscape, nurseries, municipalities, and watershed level. Uh, John received his bachelor's degree at Cal Poly Pomona and master's degree in pest management from UC Riverside. Um, he has an MBA from Pepperdine University and a doctorate in entomology from UC Riverside. Uh, he is uh, most recently awarded the 2011 California Agri Cultural Pest Control Advisors Association, CAPCA, Outstanding Contribution Agricultural Award, 2014 Green Industry Hall of Fame Award, 2016 WC International Society of Arboriculture Arbor Research Award, uh, 2018 California Urban Forest Council uh, Urban Tree Legacy Award, and 2019 uh, reduce the risk of from invasive species coalition, uh, the outstanding volunteer achievement award. Uh, having active research in the shot hole bore, uh, we will have these uh, two present. Go ahead, John. So I'm going to go very quickly through the biology um, because that's that is on our uh, pshb.org website. That's pshb.org. And if you want to get more detail, you can go back to that website. And we even have an online training course. So we'll talk about the biology of the beetle and the fungus, uh, the distribution and impact this beetle is having, what the symptoms um, look like, and uh, a little bit on lookalike pest, and then best management practices. So the, the beetle is quite small. And the entry hole you see on the tree is really only 0.85 uh, millimeters. So the, the beetle on the left, the light colored one is the male and the one on the right is the female. And the populations in the tree are biased towards the females. There are several species of beetles and the ones that we're concerned about 
are Diplificus and the Corrosio shot hole bore. And the importance of the beetle is that it's, it's carrying the fungus. So it's going into the tree, making a gallery, and then growing the fungus on the galleries. And the beetle feeds on the fungus, and the fungus is what actually attacks the tree. The tea shot hole bore, for all intents and purposes, is not here and not really considered that important. The only way to distinguish between Polyphagus and Corrosio is to use DNA analysis. And we've, over time, developed a list of trees that have uh, been able to sustain a population of beetles. So we call them reproductive hosts, and that means that the tree um, <clears throat> can be attacked by the fusarium. And we broke it up into two lists. So the first 15 are what we call the very susceptible trees or plants to ISHB. And you'll notice I say that this is not a do not plant list. So I know one of the questions today is can we replant some of these plants? And the answer is yes, kind of. And we'll talk about that more later. The most susceptible tree is the box elder, Acer nagundo. And whenever we're looking in a new area for this beetle, we try to find all the box elders and that would, that would be where it would be first. The next tree we look for is the California sycamore. And then in the riparian areas, we're looking at the cottonwoods. There are some oaks that are more susceptible than others. And the two oaks of, of notice are the belly oak and the English oak. So this is the other 47. And there actually is another one we're going to be adding to this list very soon. But the one thing I want to mention here is that the first list is the trees that they primarily prefer. And when the populations build up to tremendous numbers in an area, if you do, not, if you do nothing and just let it build up to tremendous numbers, it will start to go into these other species because there's so many of them, they're desperate to attack anything. And they'll attack it in such high numbers that even a resistant tree will often succumb to the beetle and support a population. So the biology is that the females, um, the sisters mate with the brothers, often the mothers mate with their sons in the gallery inside the tree. This is a very unusual behavior, and this is what makes this such a dangerous pest. Uh, the female, when she leaves the tree, usually they stay in a tree until, uh, for several generations, until they, they really um, almost kill the tree. And then they leave en masse, and they'll go to uh, surrounding trees. And the female will immediately start making a gallery and trying to grow the fungus. If she can successfully grow the fungus, then she will lay her eggs, and then the other life stages will develop until they get back around to pupating, and the females will mate with any males in the galleries. And you can see here that uh, there is an entry, and it goes through the bark into the cambium layer, and then it starts to branch out into the xylem. And if you look at the next photo, you'll see that once the fusarium is growing on the, the walls of the gallery, it then will start to attack further into the wood of the tree, which is what is, is causing death of these trees. So you can see here, this is a tree where you can see the dieback. So there's a heavy population attacking the trunk and the branches, and it's, it's compromised the xylems so badly that the tree is starting to die back. And if you cut open the tree, you can find just massive amounts of tunneling and uh, various stages of the beetle. On the sycamore, it tends to stay in the cambial layer, and then on, on the middle picture, you see a branch. And this is one of the dangers that we have in public areas is that it can totally compromise the branch. And the result is that the huge branches will fall. And in uh, UCI, one of the <clears throat> big concerns was that a, a branch would fall on a student. So most beetles will start their galleries in the same tree they're born in. And over several generations, that tree then will start to support huge numbers of beetles. So one beetle uh, after about six generations, and this is the very conservative number. 
So five is about the lowest I would say. I would say it could be anywhere from five to 20 daughters from one beetle. But after about six generations at the most conservative number, you would have almost 100,000 beetles. And just, just multiply that out looking at all the, the holes on the tree, and you can see there's millions of beetles in that tree. And when that tree starts to die and the temperature is correct, then they'll fly off to the surrounding trees. So the way this came in, we believe is on woodpacking material from Southeast Asia. It could be uh, Vietnam or Taiwan or any of those Asian countries. And it came in, we think, in 2003, but was misidentified. And in 2012, Dr. Esklin at UC Davis um, identified it as Polyphagus shadow borer. It was initially mistaken for T shadow borer by USDA in 2003, and that's why it got away from us. Uh, the problem we're having now is in the, the heavily infested areas, there is a tremendous amount of movement of wood. And this is not just a, an issue for shadow borer, it's an issue for goat spotted oak borer and any other pests that could be in those logs. So initially in 2012, um, when we realized we had polyphagous shadow borer, uh, we looked at Los Angeles, which was the, the epicenter where it first landed. And because they misidentified it, they had let it spread quite a bit. And then in 2014, you can see that it's gone up into um, San Fernando Valley and uh, down towards San Diego. In the blue on the bottom, you can see that is a infestation of the corrosial shot hole bores. So the, the red is the polyphagus from Vietnam. The blue is the corrosial from Taiwan. And then there was a fine or a couple of fines of the Corocio up in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara. We don't think they're established populations. But the only way to explain that is that that's what we call human-mediated transport. I mean, somebody moved infested wood from San Diego all the way up to San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara, or infested trees. That's also a possibility. So this is the current um, uh, extent of the infestation. There is a population in Santa Barbara that we are uh, going to survey very soon, and we think most of those trees were wiped out by those um, horrible floods they had in Santa Barbara, just washed whole large trees down. Uh, and, and so those populations may or may not still be there, but it is as far as Ojai in uh, Ventura County and all the way down into Mexico. So when we talked about the potential for this to be a problem, uh, one of the problems with this beetle is, is most of the time it's something you don't notice until, until it's killing a tree. And that's why it's kind of an insidious beetle and fungus complex. However, in 2015, down in the Tijuana River, uh, we had a, a problem where there was a endangered species habitat of, of willow in the river. And in May 2015, uh, it was a, a really robust habitat. And nine months later in February, uh, over 140,000 willow trees were severely damaged. Now there is some re-sprouting from the um, willows, but the mature trees that we saw in the first picture, um, those are gone. It's mostly uh, re-sprouts from the trees that survived. To give you an urban uh, example, here is Laguna Niguel Regional Park, and you can see the uh, sycamores, and then in 2017, you can see how many sycamores were removed. Pretty devastating once you let the populations build high numbers. It moves fast, but in those first four generations, you don't even notice it. And then once it builds up to that very high population and starts to uh, kill the tree, then you, you see um, the die-off. So in California, the urban impact could be very substantial, and this is why uh, the legislature uh, passed Assembly Bill 2470 last year uh, with $5 million, and then this year they supplemented that $5 million with uh, $5 million that they gave to CAL FIRE uh, to be used by uh, agencies for tree removals and surveying detection. Uh, however, if, you're looking, if you look at the numbers, uh, the numbers are huge, and we're talking uh, billions of dollars of damage and millions of dollars, hundreds of million dollars in loss of ecosystem services. 
Well, there's two scenarios. If we lose 50% or if we lose 80%, it, it really just depends on, the, on a lot of variables. If it moves into Northern California, there are potentially 100 million trees at risk. So there have been some research done at UCR by um, a grad student, and he found that it can basically move all the way up to Northern California uh, and across into the Central Valley. So a very potential for this to move. And looking at trees uh, at UCI when we were dissecting the trees when, when UCI was removing them, we also noticed another um, fungus that was in the tree. So if you look at the, the trunk up the left, the brown, dark brown area, that is another fungus. It's a Botrosferia, which is very common, especially during drought years. It's more virulent than the Fusarium, in fact. And uh, what happens is that this new Fusococcum par uh, parvum um, will make the tree more susceptible, and the beetles will walk and get, um, drill galleries into that area. And if you look at the beetles after they've uh, made galleries into the Botrosferia infected wood, you'll see they're covered with Botrosferia fungi. And then when they go back in healthy wood and make galleries, they infect it with the Botrosferia. So that makes the problem, a bad problem worse. So identification of this beetle, is, it's very tiny, about the size of a, a sesame seed. One of the ways that we ask people to send us photos when they think they might have it is to put a medium ballpoint pen, the tip right by the hole. You, in this picture on the left, you can actually see the abdomen of the female. She uh, regularly tries to block that tunnel, and we think it might be for um, Airflow, airflow movement, maybe to keep other pests or beetles out of the tunnel. But um, if you see that hole, put a pen by it, take a good, good photo that's in focus. And that tells us uh, with, with a great deal of confidence that it is, in fact, a beetle. And you can see on the right where we shaved away the wood. When you shave away the bark on sycamore, you should see green tissue. But if you shave it away and you see the entry hole and then you see fungus right around the entry hole, that's the fusarium growing on the surface of the tunnel and then moving out into the tree. Every tree exhibits a different symptom. They react differently. Uh, they would not react this way probably if you pounded a nail into the tree. It's just how the, the trees respond to attack. So in sycamores, <clears throat> it's staining. In many of, of the, uh, the trees that, that gum, we get the gumming. Um, you get sugary exudate with avocado, and then the top right corner is box elder. And box elder has no resistance to this beetle, so it doesn't produce anything except for the sawdust. Uh, you might see a little bit of, of um, wet staining, but basically the beetles move into it so fast and build up to such high numbers so quickly that that is the most susceptible tree, and that's why we always look for it first. So once again, you take a look at the bark, you shave it a little bit, see if you get green tissue, the hole, and the infected tissue around the hole. So here's a coast live oak. It stains when the tree is initially attacked, and then over time, um, the tree will stop responding, and you'll see the holes and, and sawdust. The white alders you get a certain type of a staining. This is where the staining dries up, and then the sycamores on the right. By the way, um, you, you can pound um, Staples, when people staple lights on the tree or, or notices on the tree, we get the same type of symptoms from a distance. You have to go up close and look for that tree with, the, with that specific size hole in it. Here's acacia, Chinese flame tree, and it even, if you have very high populations, uh, it, will, it will even be so desperate that it will go after Kentia palm, and we've actually seen it kill Kentia palms when it's in a very, very highly populated area. So what we need to do to confirm this beetle is actually run the DNA. And so you can run the DNA off the adult beetle, which is oftentimes very difficult to find. Um, certain times of the day and certain times of the year, you can actually see them walking around and flying. But most of the time when we go out, we don't see the beetle, we see the hole. And so um, you would tissue sample the tissue uh, we would do this as, as experts that are doing the survey. We have a, um, um, 
assessment online on pshp.org. If you filled out the assessment and took the photos and we thought it was it, then we would send somebody out the sample. So it's not really something you need to worry about. Uh, this is uh, what one of the pages on the pshp.org looks like. So you can see on the right, we have the online assessment for people who aren't familiar with this and, and want to verify whether they have it or not. There are many beetles that attack these trees. Some are smaller, some are larger, and that's why we want you to use that pen tip so we get an idea of the size. We have developed over the years some best management practices, and we continue to develop them. Uh, in fact, with AB 2470, uh, two, two million of that will be used for various research projects that have been identified as high priority. But the IPM program that we have developed so far that seems to be working quite well, actually, is to monitor for the beetle. And as I said before, if you have uh, a grove of sycamores, it will go in initially to one or two trees, build up to tremendous numbers, it might take uh, a couple of years to do that, and then it will just uh, explode out into the other trees. So if you monitor, you have a good chance of spotting the, the amplifier trees, as we call them, and removing or treating the amplifier trees before they can infest the other trees. If you ignore this, let the amplifier trees die, and then release uh, millions of beetles, then it's much more difficult because now you're, you're dealing with um, widespread infestants. So um, once you monitor, you have a decision that you can make. If it's a lightly infested tree, you can prune it. We just remove the infested parts if it's the branches. You can remove the whole tree if it's heavily infested or severely infested, or you can treat the tree. The main thing is once you do all these things, you have to assess the effectiveness. So we came up with uh, some numbers. People were asking how do we determine how badly infested it is, and so this is something we've been using for a while. Uh, you look at the level of infestation, look at the number of entry exit holes. If it's less than 50, it's called a low infestation, and if there's no dieback, that is very treatable. If it's moderate, 50 to 150 with no dieback, that is still very treatable if you don't have a large number of trees infested. If it's heavy, graded than 150 with no dieback, uh, that you have to make a decision on based on, on your particular situation. And then if it's severe, greater than 150 beetles attacking the tree, total, you know, total 150 attacking that tree and dieback, we recommend that that tree be removed because that then will become an amplifier tree. There are many ways to monitor for this. Uh, one that's um, not as effective as visual survey, but is more cost effective, is to use traps. And so there's a Lindgren funnel trap, and there's also an elm leaf beetle panel trap. Uh, we have been migrating mostly to the elm leaf beetle panel trap because of the ease of looking at beetles actually in the glue. We just look at it. We don't have to take a cup out separate out all the other insects in it, and then identify it. Uh, this works pretty well. You add a lure to that, which is actually a, a, it's a weak lure because a pheromone will attract from long distances. Lures only attract for yards. Uh, and the number of traps that you put out there depends on your budget, how much manpower you have, and how, much, how many dollars you have. So here's a typical average of what these beetles are doing. They spend most of their life in the tree. That's why the environment is not a major factor in terms of when the beetles are in the tree. Uh, the beetles are only coming out of the tree when the air temperatures are correct. And we tend to get two or three peaks, uh, one in February, March, and one in the fall right about now. In fact, we're seeing a lot of activity right now. And so those are the two times when treatments are really effective just prior to that. So in uh, Orange County, in the park system, we, we did some of this analysis early on, and we did see uh, somewhat of a preference for certain diameter trees. And so the, the larger trees from seven to about 19 inches, that was the preferred size, didn't attack uh, small diameter trees, um, unless the populations were extremely high. But on um, 
on the scenario we had in the parks. It was a heavy population, but uh, not so heavy that it was going after the smaller trees, mostly the, um, the 7 to 19 inch trees. So there's just another graphic uh, showing uh, infestations. We looked at, uh, we've been looking at about 6,700 trees on a regular basis. And then of all infested trees, very similar, although we, we tend to see a little bit more on the larger trees when we get to uh, all, all species. And then by height, we see that you know, it's, it's the older trees that are getting hit. So now that we talked about the importance of monitoring, let's talk a little bit about the, the treatments. So you can prune, you can remove, you can treat. And it's really important that you dispose properly of the infested material. And removing heavily infested trees, you can see this tree, all those little brown spots are what we call attacks or hits on that tree. Um, this one we don't have time for. You only gave me 30 minutes. It's going to take you 30 minutes to count them all. So once you get a tree that's heavily infested like this and there's dieback and you decide to remove it, we also um, recommend that in addition to grinding the tree into uh, one inch or smaller chips, that you remove the stump because we have found several stumps now that we ignored and we found a year later to still producing beetles. So chipping one inch or smaller will kill 98% of the beetles. And then with the chips, you can do several things with it. Uh, solarized compost, send it to the dump until 2020, they won't accept it, I guess. And then biogeneration plants will also often accept chips. Or you could solarize or kiln dry it. In the infested area, uh, if you wanted to save money, you could actually uh, chip it to one inch smaller and then use it as mulch in an infested area. But do not use chips in an uninfested area. And always cover the load when you're moving this because they, they can fly uh, from this load into surrounding areas. We've done a lot of work with chemicals to look at uh, whether or not th these trees can be treated and the population is controlled. And we actually have found that on low and medium infested trees, there are several sprays, trunk sprays, systemic soil uh, drenches or injections, and then trunk injections. Trunk injections, we, tr we leave for the final you know, last, last uh, resort, uh, because when you drill into a tree to inject, you're actually opening up an uh, infection site for possible uh, entrance by pathogens. And the natural enemies and all of that in the biological control arena is primarily in the research phase right now. We are funding uh, Dr. Stouthammer and Dr. Escalin to look at natural enemies. They've been going to Taiwan, Vietnam. They're going to be going to the Philippines next. They've brought back uh, candidate parasitoids. Uh, Dr. Escalin's a plant pathologist. He's looking at entomopathogenic fungi. We do have a, um, a bacillus that is registered and actually works. So that's one that we, we see in the top on, under trunk sprays, you see bacillus subtilis. Uh, we are continuing to do spray trials to look at candidates. We haven't exhausted uh, the list of potential candidates, but it's a matter of, of uh, time and money. Uh, once you do all of this, it's once again really important that you assess effectiveness, and that's the downfall of many programs. Uh, they, they do their treatments, whatever they are, and they don't go back and assess the effectiveness. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. One is to uh, use traps, and the other is to do visual survey but it is absolutely essential that you do that. So we are, as I said, we're going to these panel traps. You find them much easier to use and much easier to check. We also do visual surveys. And once you do the visual surveys, you learn that initially this beetle will attack the north side of the tree, northeast, northwest. And then it moves around to the south side. That's most of the time. So if you're visually surveying, and you're walking down a pathway and you only look at the south side of a tree, uh, you may not see it until the population is pretty high. You have to walk around that tree or make sure that you at least go to the north side. One other way we assess the tree is, uh, you, you remember I showed you that photograph of the female blocking that 
that entry that she um, blocks it with her abdomen. If you paint it, we use uh, water-based acrylic paint. If you paint that and block that hole, she will uh, unblock it. And that's um, a very effective way. So we paint it and we may come back the next, the next day sometimes. You can come back that after a few hours later and she will have broken through the paint because she does not want to impede the airflow into that tunnel. So to um, summarize, you want to monitor, then make the decision on your treatment, and then assess the effectiveness. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. As I said, we have AB2470 authored by Grayson and Lorena Gonzalez-Fletcher. We have $5 million. We are probably going to be um, Spending that money in October, we're going to be finishing up the contracts, and there will be rapid, um, well, there'll be survey detection and um, uh, rapid response as part of it, and there'll be uh, research, education, outreach, and um, tree removals. CAL FIRE is getting $5 million, and those, those will be used in conjunction with the AB2470 monies to um, Help, help with the uh, survey detection and the rapid response and the two removals. So just kind of to summarize here, one of the questions I always think about and, and I, the questions I get from the audience um, is, um, the first one is that the, 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 the beetle vector is the fungus that causes the fusarium die back and, and only the fungus feeds on the tree and the tree can only become a reproductive host if the fungus can colonize a tree. Uh, the number, size, and density of preferred, susceptible, or reproductive hosts really makes a big difference. So when you're making the decision of what to do, uh, you need to consider all those factors. One of the things I will tell you is that when you're designing landscapes, if you go 100% sycamores, um, that is a mistake. You know. We've preached this for decades. You want to have diversity in your planting so that if something comes in, it can't devastate your whole planting or build up to the tremendous numbers. Um, as ISHB populations increase in a localized landscape, we have seen that as the populations get higher and higher and it exhausts the, the preferred host, it will start moving into other plants to see if it can reproduce. And it has successfully done that to the point where we now have about 64 reproductive hosts, but only, as I showed you before, only 15 are really uh, preferred or susceptible. And the rest of them, we found those reproductive hosts, when the numbers were really high, we just found them attacking anything nearby, and if they could grow the fungus, then they started reproducing. And then remember, initially attacking builds up on only a few trees in an area. And so if, you, if you're designing the landscape and you have a few preferred hosts, it's, it's much easier then to monitor for it because you're not, you're not having to monitor as many trees. But you do have to monitor the preferred host on a regular basis, and that way you can move in very quickly and control the low or medium infested trees. So monitoring is absolutely critical to a successful IPM program. And uh, at Disneyland, we have been doing that for the last uh, about three years. Uh, we've been implementing an IPM program based on and what I just talked about, and we have very successfully controlled the problem. It, it kind of spikes every so often, but our, our monitoring catches it, and then we're able to, to intervene and control the, the problem. So with that, any, any questions? For me, or do you want to go directly to Matt? Are we awake? I think they're all on mute. I'm going to let my, uh, Matt start now. Thanks, Matt.
Great. Um, yeah, so what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit more in depth about the infestation uh, that we experienced on uh, the UCI campus and our response and the lessons that we learned. Uh, talk a little bit about our, uh, our reforestation strategy and then uh, talk a little bit about best practices, you know, that we can all look to. And John talked about this a little bit as designers, um, uh, best practices to avoid um, future issues of infestation. So with that, uh, just a little bit of background on the UCI campus. Uh, we have about 1,500 acres uh, is the size of our campus, and then we have a 200-acre San Joaquin Marsh Reserve, which is part of the UC Natural Reserve System, which is just adjacent to the campus. We have around 16,000 people, um, faculty and students that are living on campus. And we have a daytime population of around 40,000 um, people that are on campus every day. And then uh, it's a heavily built environment. We have 15 million square feet of uh, building space and we're a, a growing campus so um, a lot of the we have a lot of land that is protected open space but we also have a lot of uh, building yet to do uh, we're one of the younger uh, UC campuses so we're uh, close to about 50 percent build out uh, looking at our landscaped areas and our open space um, we have a mix of you know, natural areas that are um, permanently preserved open spaces as well as, you know, highly uh, maintained urban landscapes uh, towards the academic core, the center of the campus. We have uh, estimated around 30,000 uh, trees throughout the campus and around 18,000 trees uh, in the academic core in our student housing areas. Um, this, we also have a variety of different types of habitat ranging from the San Joaquin Marsh, uh, uh, wetland habitat to riparian habitats, and then upland habitat, uh, which is our ecological preserve in some of our um, higher elevation open space areas. We also have a, a sustainable landscape uh, plan called the Green and Gold Plan that's been around for uh, years. And the intent of that plan uh, from an early uh, iteration was to have uh, goals, you know, that would include uh, focus, uh, focusing our plantings on native and drought tolerant plants, and then um, a diversity of uh, plants as well. And then um, something that most of us or all of us on this call understand is just the importance of open space areas and it's uh, very vital to our mission uh, and the, uh, the university as a place to, um, to identify um, place value to the, to the campus. Um, so there's um, value based just on that, on identification of the campus, but there's also our open spaces uh, present um, opportunities to, you know, have ecosystem services and environmental benefits, including carbon sequestration. Um, we all love the shade of our trees, obviously, um, and then habitat value. And then uh, economic value, um, John mentioned this a little bit at a, a statewide scale. Um, once we were infested, um, we started to uh, evaluate our trees monetarily, and the 18,000 trees um, was 40, 41 million dollars for the campus. Um, so it is a, a, a large asset uh, to us. A little bit about the history of the infestation. We, we recognized the infestation in late 2014, and um, it was, as John mentioned, kind of in the, the late cycle of life. So it, it really went from, you know, low population to an extremely uh, high uh, infestation where we had 
over 2,000 trees that were attacked, and you can see in the map those are the, the dots that are red, and a lot of those are in um, some of our highly used public areas, including our ring mall, uh, the, the park itself, um, and our gateway quad. Um, there were 75 species, different species that we found uh, that were attacked, everything from uh, trees to shrubs. Um, and I do want to go back one couple slides. I want to just point out, because this will be important later, the ring mall, which is uh, shown in purple, um, and you can kind of see something that uh, the campus did and is very common in our practice is to, you know, have a street tree theme, which is a, a monoculture of one species kind of marching down the street to provide kind of repetition and form. And this is what kind of led to us having some uh, significant issues with our infestation. So even though our green and gold plan called for um, a diverse species list, we did use this uh, idea of a street tree theme where we were placing a large number of trees in one area, um, which we proved to be uh, devastating for us. So this is just a list of the, the different species that were attacked um, at UCI, and, and it's in order of um, how many were actually infested for us. Uh, the area along the ring mall um, and in the park, we have um, a, a large number of platinum species. So the entire ring mall, that what I was showing in purple, was all uh, western sycamores, uh, Mexican sycamores, and London plane trees. And then we had some very uh, old heritage trees in the park that were have been around since the beginning of campus uh, that were also heavily infested. So that gives a little bit of background on just our infestation. Um, it was, it came on very quickly. It infest, it, it was very widespread, uh, but also concentrated heavily in some of our areas where we had uh, those species that became amplifier trees. Um, our response was very swift, and we were very fortunate to have. Uh, resources within the UCI campus and then as well as um, John and some of the researchers at UCR uh, that were able to come in and, and help us. Uh, we formed a, a team, a work group on the campus to address this because we knew of how significant of an impact it was going to be and if we didn't act quickly it could become a, a very devastating uh, issue. So we removed um, close to 800 trees on the campus um, within the ring mall, primarily Gateway Quad, and then also in the park. And then we needed to look at reforestation. With that, we wanted to develop a strategy that made sense in our reforestation. The first thing that we wanted to do um, was identify uh, a list of species um, that we would use in the reforestation. And we did that by looking at all of the resources that you're all very familiar with, Bob Perry's books and uh, old resources where we just created a, a table and we started looking at uh, trees that maybe we had used in the past and that maybe we need to bring back. Um, there, because we were kind of on the front end or one of the the land managers in Orange County that was on the front end of reforesting, there weren't a lot of uh, resources or people that we could ask that had uh, done any kind of reforesting. There had been some work done um, in Pasadena, and but that was about it, and they were really only using what they had found to be resistant at that time, which was um, just one tree species. So it wasn't a lot of help, but so from that uh, list, we looked at environmental factors as well as uh, what we were seeing in the field and other areas. If there were tree species that were not showing any signs of attack that were 
uh, located next to an amplifier tree, we knew that was a good, a good candidate. And then there were certain species that, like pines, uh, that were also, uh, you know, resistant to the beetle that we also looked at. We wanted to be careful. The inventory that we did on the campus showed us, you know, we had, it was the first time we had done one. It had showed us uh, how heavy we were on some uh, plant or some tree species that uh, we didn't want to uh, increase that. So uh, we were careful to not um, add more to our, you know, the higher percentage trees of our urban forest in case there were future issues. Um, so the, we, we developed a, a list of trees, and this was a collaborative uh, effort. We reached out to um, different arborists. Uh, we worked with some, on some of the early phasing with Spurlock Landscape Architects in San Diego uh, to help us identify some trees uh, to use uh, that were new to the campus. Um, and then from this list, we developed kind of a, a mix of trees that were evergreen or flowering or deciduous that, that we would use in our uh, reforestation effort. And so this is just a list of those species that we've been using to date. Um, there were a handful, not on this list, that we tried um, that did not work out, but I think that was mostly due to just the environmental uh, conditions of the of where they were planted and not the beetle itself. So a couple um, just notes on, on what we looked at when we were uh, developing our strategy of reforestation. We wanted to, um, in open areas it was pretty simple. We could do kind of more of a naturalistic pattern of planting. Um, but in some areas, we wanted to retain that street tree theme. So as an example, uh, in Ring Road, which is the, the circle that kind of defines our campus, the main pedestrian element, uh, where we had removed all of the platinum species, we decided to uh, keep the street tree theme, that idea, but change it in quads. So as you walk around the the mall, we would have a, a double row or a couple rows of uh, elms, and then it would transition to uh, a pine or more naturalistic uh, pattern with pines and arbutus, and then sap we used sapiums, um, we used uh, pink trumpet tree, the handranthos, and then um, crepe myrtles as well. So we went from you know, one kind of monoculture to six different types of street trees, but we kept that same kind of rigid uh, planting design. Um, on the picture to the left, this is a, one of our main campus entry points where we had Mexican sycamores uh, that aligned along a bridge and into the, the pedestrian um, corridor of the campus uh, by when we removed those, we wanted to make it a more diverse palette. That was an important goal for us. So what we did was uh, we lined it with a uh, Brisbane box, and then we tried a new tree, um, the Chinese French tree, um, and that has uh, worked out well to date. Another uh, important goal or strategy that we incorporated was in areas that allowed us to um, plant a, a second row or a second background tree, we would add that in for kind of redundancy. So if, if the elms failed, we would have something behind it. So in the picture on the right, we have uh, the Drake elm uh, lining the ring mall. And then uh, behind that or to the right, we have um, jacarandas planted. And then our reforestation phasing, um, we prioritized uh, the areas that were most visible and most visited and the most impacted, which is the, the areas in blue, so uh, the gateway quad and a portion of the ring mall. And we used uh, large 
trees in that area, 36 inch box and higher just to, to have some sort of a, an immediate effect or a, a canopy uh, quickly. And then in later phases, we focused on uh, the rest of the ring mall as well as areas that were uh, infested in the Aldrich Park. And then um, later stages, we had more infestations at campus entries along Campus Drive uh, near Mesa Court. And then the last phase, we had a, a number of uh, birch trees that were in alders that were uh, infested heavily that we removed in a riparian area. And in the later phases, uh, the last phase, we've actually have replanted um, western sycamores and oaks. And I think that's it for us, so we would uh, open it up to any questions you may have. Uh, John, I believe, uh, um, Matt, we have a question and answer that you can click at the top of the screen. We have uh, our first uh, question from Esther. It's what is the cost of treatment and how well known are the methods? You wanna throw that to John? So the cost of treatment can vary quite a bit. Um, it can, we are, we are currently uh, trying to use <clears throat> Monitoring. So, in cost of treatment, you might want to think about monitoring. So, I'll give you an example. Um, City of Claremont. They, at last a couple of years ago, they injected all of their trees, and <clears throat> each tree that was injected, I think it cost a couple hundred dollars per tree to inject, and they were injecting trees whether they were infested or not. So um, it was uh, <clears throat> problematic in that if the tree doesn't have the beetle and it's not in a heavily infested area, the tree probably will not get the beetle for quite a while. And you've just spent <clears throat> $200 on the tree and you drill the hole into the tree, which potentially could, could um, let you have an infection court where you can introduce a pathogen. So <clears throat> properly done, you know, it's it's pretty safe, but you know, you have that, it's just like surgery, isn't there There's such thing as a 100% safe drilling into a tree. Um, what they've done now is they, they have put their money into monitoring, and we, <clears throat> we are actually, as they monitor, uh, they monitor frequently enough that they can catch uh, infestations when they first get there and they just take a hypodermic and inject the treatment right into that hole because that female hasn't had time to, to make a gallery system with lots of eggs and larvae. So we just received funding to verify that. We've actually been doing that a couple of years experimentally and it, it looks like it works. So we're gonna do a large scale trial and run the statistics. So uh, it could be as, as simple as the cost of monitoring uh, of the preferred host and then simply injecting the, the few hits that you find. Um, that's that's gonna be very soon that we're gonna actually finish up that trial and write it up. The other treatments, the soil injections or soil drenches with systemic and the treatment of the tree, um, those are usually um, under $200 to do. You may have to do it more frequently, like I say, depending on your trapping and survey. You may have to do it three times a year, <clears throat> but um, those treatments uh, can be, um, if it's a light infestation, you might get away with just a bark treatment. That would just be just $30, $40. So, so it varies. I know it, that's not a simple answer, but it's we have a matrix actually that uh, UCI uses and OC Parks and, and now Disneyland have a matrix, a decision matrix. <clears throat> they look at the host species, they look at whether it's preferred host or not, they look at the level of infestation value. and the value, 
and then they make a decision on, and also whether or not it's a hazard and they make a decision based on that matrix of what they're going to do. Uh, many, many of the decisions on the initial part with low, uh, low value tree, not preferred host, it's basically just keep monitoring and if it's attacking some branches, remove the branches. Uh, when it gets to high value trees, high hazard, etc., then you're going to go with the more expensive uh, treatments. It did, I hope that answered your question. But basically, from like thirty, forty dollars to all the way up to about several hundred dollars per tree. Thank you, John. And by the way, uh, we have another tree, question. Uh, removing a tree is about one thousand to two thousand dollars. So we have a question uh, from Leland, uh, and this has to do with the health of the tree. Uh, was infestation greater where soil was more impacted, um, more impacted by compaction, the soil around the trees? Well, so we haven't quite figured out all of the variables that create ideal conditions, but we, we do notice that it was, it's in uh, disturbed landscapes. So any uh, landscape in an urban situation, that seems to be the variable where we're finding the beetles. In the, in the uh, undisturbed landscapes, we don't see it as much. Um, so I would say that a compacted soil probably has an influence, but there is some research indicating that too much fertilizer is, a, is an important variable. We, we initially thought irrigation was the important variable, but the research is showing that maybe irrigation is not as important as fertilization. And then all the trees that we're dealing with are in compacted soils. So that, that's um, probably an important variable. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is from Esther. Uh, are the most recent maps of the infestation on the web? She said she found one on UCANR site and shows data from 2013 on the west side of LA. Uh, are there any recent updates? And are there any of the UC Irvine uh, tree lists available um, to send out to the, um, the participants of this event? You can answer first. Yeah, I'll answer first. I'm, I'm happy to send uh, my presentation, um, which has that slide of the, the trees that we use. Um, and then if anyone wants to reach out to me uh, personally, I can also share the uh, spreadsheet um, that we've developed. But it's slightly outdated because we haven't been, um, it, it would need some updating before I send it out. And then from the standpoint of um, the map, on the PS, pshb.org, there is a map. <clears throat> and it, it's not a survey that we did. It's basically when people called in or we saw trees that were infested and we sampled it. And it, it, to be on that map, it has to be confirmed by a lab as either the fungus or the beetle. The funding from AB 2470 is going to give us some money to do more uh, official type of surveys. Um, <clears throat> and so, that map is just an indication that it's in the area, but it's, it's not a, like a grid survey type of map. Um, that, will, that will be filled in a little bit now with, with the money that we're getting for surveys. Um, and then, the, for instance, on that map, you'll see the Orange County Parks. Orange County Parks are heavily surveyed by us, the university. And so all the infestations in the OC Parks those are all confirmed, and those are that's a, um, a regular survey that's done looking at individual trees. In the other areas, it's whether somebody called us or we saw a problem and, and we sampled and confirmed it. So it's only an indication, and um, I, I must tell everybody that everybody says, oh, it's, uh, Southern California is, is totally infested. No, it's not. We have, for instance, in the park system here, uh, Irvine Regional Park was uninfested for the first several years, and it's only become infested in the last couple of years, 
And so we're doing the monitoring and then uh, treatment and, and pruning uh, to manage it in Irvine Regional Park. So you need to just assess your landscape and do a survey to determine whether you're infested or not. All right, thank you, John. Uh, do you, uh, this question is from James. Do you know of any examples or literature that include monitoring and construction specs or maintenance plans? I think some of the, the, the uh, CAL FIRE grants to uh, put in um, habitat, or what, what do they call that? Um, mitigation? Yeah, mitigation sites, a lot of those have uh, some language in there about monitoring. Okay, uh, so second, another question we have uh, is from Colleen. Um, have you ever seen any reinfestations in the trees the phase one areas were planted in 2015? Uh, we have not and we do monitor. Um, I walk by it all the time. Um, so that though those trees still look good, we did give the trees in our reforestation and our planting. Uh, if if we were, um, and this happened on all of our capital projects too, for any tree that was non-fruit bearing that we were planting, uh, we included imidacloprid tablets uh, within the planting uh, to prevent or kind of give a, a jump start on protection uh, for the tree from the beetle. Okay. Uh, you know, I have question? a comment too. Oh, um, one, one of the one of the things you need to do when you're when you're <clears throat> specking out planting of landscapes, those trees have to be inspected when they're planted, because I've seen not necessarily shadow bore, but I've seen a lot of infested material, plant material going into a landscape, and then we have to go back and deal with the problem later. So. Um, you know, if, it's a, if you're buying a big box tree and it's a preferred host and it's in an area where, where we know there's shot hole bore, uh, those trees need to be inspected and certified free. And then, uh, and then also during the establishment period, I think there needs to be something in, in the specs about monitoring the trees. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, next question is from Laura, um, and this is, from a landscape architect's um, position, um, would the best idea be to contact a licensed arborist um, to identify these borers? Not necessarily. Um, some arborists have been trained and are really good, and other arborists have been misidentifying this. So we're getting calls, uh, could you confirm whether we have this or not, and we go out and it's not it. So being a certified arborist doesn't mean that they can identify an insect. Um, I, I would say the best thing to do is if you can get a arborist who can prove they've had experience with this uh, and, and also that they've gone through some, some training, that would, that would help. But I, I would think that, um, that arborists, if they tell you that you have it, they need to, to take a sample and get that sample confirmed as positive <clears throat> as a shadow bore beetle or as the fungus, the Eulacea fungus. Without a confirmation from a lab, uh, I would be reluctant unless the person was um, a known expert to accept it. You can go on to our uh, self-assessment tool on phhp.org and you can um, send in answer the questions and send in the photographs that we request and and we can kind of confirm through that if you have the pen pen tip right next to the hole we can kind of confirm what the arborist might have said but I think in, in any case when it when there's a lot of dollars at stake you should always get a laboratory confirmation and you can do that by sending the samples uh, to the uh, local agricultural commissioner or the Department of Food and Agriculture, they, they have uh, agreed to start accepting samples. All right, thank you, John. All right, last question from Richard. Uh, can you clarify the comment about fertilizing? It wasn't clear if the trees were fertilized were more or less vulnerable. So the, the um, 
comment about fertilizer uh, came, came from a couple of different studies, one at UC Santa Barbara and uh, one, they're <clears throat> it's still kind of in the hypothesis stage, but some trials that were done at UC Santa Barbara and uh, some observational work being done in the Tijuana River by John Bowen, uh, both of them indicate that it looks like higher levels of fertilizer might make the trees more susceptible. And uh, John Bowen thinks that in the Tijuana River, it was the sewage spills that created really high levels of, of fertilizer uh, that might have triggered that, that um, kind of epidemic. <clears throat> the Santa Barbara studies also indicate that higher levels of fertilizer might, um, might be an indication. But, but those are all kind of trials <laughs> in, uh, in, in progress. They haven't really published it yet, but their, their data suggests that that's, that's the case. All right, thank you, John and Matt. That looks like that's the end of our questions. Um, I appreciate you all attending. Uh, this has been a, a webinar with SoCal ASLA and UCI Cooperative Extension Program. Um, we, if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to SoCal ASLA or Matt. Uh, did you want to provide your email address on the screen uh, for people to reach out to you? Um, I think you can type, in, type it into the chat. <laughs> but yeah, go uh, ahead and. You you can reach out to us at ASL, SoCal ASLA and we'll connect you with Matt. Great. I appreciate everyone uh, for attending. Thank you. Thank you.